Hi guys, I hope you're all doing really well. My name is Sarah and welcome to What the Horror, the channel where we talk about horror movies, old and new. Today we're talking about and taking a deep dive into the 1973 British folk horror film, The Wicker Man. Just a heads up that this episode will include spoilers from the off, so just bear that in mind if you haven't seen the film yet. Also, I feel it's only fair to say, bear in mind that this episode does include discussion of religion, both Christianity and paganism, as this is one of the main themes in the film. So again, if this is something that you don't want to hear about or may offend you, just bear that in mind. The Wicker Man follows Sergeant Howie, who arrives on the small Scottish island of Summer Isle to investigate the report of a missing 12-year-old girl named Rowan Morrison after he receives an anonymous letter. A devout and conservative Christian, Sergeant Howie is disturbed by the islander's practice of pagan rituals, frivolous sexual activity, and teaching children about May Day celebrations and phallic association. The islanders are purposefully vague and try to hinder Howie's investigations by claiming that Rowan Morrison never existed. But after finding her name in the school register and being directed to her grave by the school teacher, Miss Rose, Sergeant Howie begins to realise there is far more going on here than a simple missing child case. Howie meets with the island magistrate, Lord Summer Isle, who explains the origins of their pagan practices date back to his grandfather, who developed strains of fruit and vegetables that would be able to prosper in the Scottish climate and persuaded others that the old gods would help the crops prosper. But when Summer Isle's crops failed last season, the islanders decide to make a sacrifice to the old gods in the hopes of having their crops replenished. And while Sergeant Howie at first believes that it is the 12-year-old Rowan who will be sacrificed, it is soon revealed that it is in fact he who is the planned sacrifice. A man who came of his own free will, a man with the power of a king, a virgin and a fool. The Wicker Man is among the most influential British films and horror films of the past 50 years. In 2004, Total Film listed The Wicker Man as the sixth best British film of all time, and the film's final scene ranked 45 on Bravo's 100 Scariest Movie Moments and 72 on Shudder's 101 Scariest Horror Movie Moments of All Time. What stood out about The Wicker Man was that it strayed away from typical horror tropes such as jump scares and gore and sets the majority of its story in the bright safety of daylight. In fact, for a lot of the runtime of The Wicker Man, you could be mistaken in thinking that you're not watching a horror film, but a crime thriller. While there is a whimsical sense of unease through the film, the horror doesn't actually kick in until the final scenes. While watching the film, whether you get on board with the pagan beliefs of the islanders or not, there is never any real sense that these are dangerous people. Irritating, sure, with their cryptic avoidance of a simple blooming question, but certainly not murderers. But as the Wicker Man lures you into a false sense of security, it then pulls the rug from under you with a perception shift as you realise the horror of the film. And this shift happens swiftly and harshly. What also stands The Wicker Man apart from other horror films, both contemporary and modern, is the fact that The Wicker Man is actually a musical horror movie. The film's soundtrack and inclusion of folk songs plays an important part in the film. It helps add to the film's feeling of surrealism and uncanniness. It also acts as a way for the islanders to communicate to each other, to Sergeant Howie's distaste and sometimes disgust. Because you have to remember that aside from one or two pieces, the Wicker Man soundtrack is diegetic and because of this, it can also help the audience feel more inclusion in the movie's story. There is no disjointed songs that can remind you that you're watching a movie. The Wicker Man also provides the audience with villains or supposed antagonists who are complex, not outright evil, and actually sympathetic and to a point 
understandable. This idea is something that is also very much present in Ariaster's Midsummer. Again, we have cult members or a community who could be argued as sympathetic and simply of a different mindset. And speaking of Midsummer, if you've seen both movies, then it isn't difficult to see the inspiration clearly drawn from The Wicker Man. Both films are set in the safety of daylight. Both have the inclusion of whimsy, vivid colours and diegetic music. And both films end with a final shot of a human sacrifice, a blaze in flames while the community rejoices. And Midsummer isn't the only place we can see the influence of The Wicker Man. Not only did it have a critically disastrous American remake in 2006, Sorry, Nick Cage, not even you can save that mess. And a sort of sequel in the 2011 The Wicker Tree. It has been referenced and parodied in other pop culture. In England, there is actually a roller coaster at Alton Towers theme park inspired by and named after the film. In 2000, heavy metal band Iron Maiden released a song called The Wicker Man, which was inspired by the film. You could also say that the idea of a country having strange little hidden communities that live by their own customs, beliefs and secrets originated with Summer Isle in The Wicker Man. I'm sure someone could point out an example that predates The Wicker Man, but this new subgenre of sorts did become more prevalent after 1973. It's certainly something we see a lot in British film and TV, for example in shows such as The League of Gentlemen created by Steve Pemberton, Rhys Shearsmith and Mark Gassis. But while many films have been influenced by The Wicker Man and it's certainly introduced new tropes, nothing has ever really come close to recapturing the same surreal, joyous, funny, otherworldliness of The Wicker Man. The Wicker Man wasn't a critical success on release and as with a lot of horror movies like The Thing for example, it would be years later before it would have the recognition that it deserved. While the end of the 70s saw the popularity of exploitation horror movies grow and the 80s and 90s were awash with teen slasher movies, The Wicker Man's popularity and place in horror began to wane again although it has always remained a classic, but perhaps it just wasn't what the younger audience of slasher movies was looking for. But things often come full circle and The Wicker Man is now perfectly at home in the horror community with the growing popularity of elevated horror. And films from directors such as Ty West, Ari Aster, Robert Eggers, whose character-driven films moved into mainstream, reaching a wider audience, can perhaps pave the way for a younger audience to revisit such classics. The Wicker Man came about when Christopher Lee, star of Dracula, Lord of the Rings, Star Wars and James Bond, became tired of starring in Dracula and Hammer horror movies. He wanted a new challenge and in 1971 he met with screenwriter Anthony Schaefer and the two decided to work on a project together. They brought Robin Hardy on board to direct and decided that they wanted to make a horror film that was based around old religion. Anthony Schaefer read the novel Ritual, written in 1967 by David Pinner. Piner? Pinner. And thought it was a good base for their story. He, Christopher Lee, and a Canadian producer of the name Peter Snell all put in £5,000 each and paid David Pinner £15,000 to buy the rights to the book. But while Ritual was the original inspiration and they had bought the rights, Schaefer ended up using very little from the book and came up with much more of an original story. I mean, there's no burning Wicker Man effigy at the end of the book. The Wicker Man was made on a budget of £500,000 and made $180,293 at the box office. Christopher Lee felt very passionately about this project and because the film had such a small budget, he appeared in the film for free. Apparently, he said in a 2001 documentary named The Wicker Man Enigma, if they paid me my normal fee and everyone else their normal fees, they wouldn't have been able to make the film. He paid money out of his own pocket and then worked for free and Lee's passion for the movie wouldn't end there. Of the 275 films he starred in, Lee claimed The Wicker Man was the best film he'd done, and on the film's release it was Christopher Lee who rang round all of the film critics he knew saying, quote, Will you do me a favour? And I will pay for your seat. 
Will you see this film that's out now? According to Lee, lots of film critics did go and even paid for themselves. The Wicker Man starred the aforementioned Christopher Lee as Lord Summer Isle and Edward Woodward as Sergeant Howie. Awesome name. The film also starred Swedish actor and sex symbol Britt Eklund as Willow, the landlord's daughter. Eklund, however, did not have a fun time film in The Wicker Man. While the film is set in the flourish of spring, they actually filmed in the freezing, dead, cold Scottish winter, and Eklund was very vocal in her dislike of the weather and the location, even speaking to the media about it. This apparently caused anger from the locals. Eklund was also angered by the fact that a body double was used for her nude scene shot below the waist. Eklund had found out that she was pregnant while on set and only agreed to do nudity from the waist up. Her lines and singing were already dubbed by Scottish actress Annie Ross, but she was unaware that they had smuggled a body double onto the set once she had left. A really random but kind of interesting fact about The Wicker Man is that Britt Eklund's boyfriend at the time, singer Rod Stewart, actually tried to buy the negatives to the film and block its release in an attempt to protect Britt Eklund's modesty. However, I do feel like if she has already decided that she will do the nudity, then that's kind of her choice, right? There are a few themes that run through The Wicker Man, such as religion, law, and good versus evil. There is also sexuality and community, but it's the first three that we're talking about today. At the core of The Wicker Man is an apparent battle between Christianity and paganism, personified by the devout Christian Sergeant Howie and the pagan practicing residents of Summer Isle. When Howie arrives on the island, he is horrified by what he witnesses, but more importantly, makes zero effort in hiding his disgust and on numerous occasions confronts the islanders about their actions and beliefs. How he enters this community with his own religion and set of beliefs and views Summer Isle through these eyes, never for a moment accepting or considering that there could be and are differing ways of living, different faiths and practices. The Summer Isle Islanders have practiced pagan rituals since Lord Summer Isle's grandfather bought the land back in the 1800s. He was, as described by Lord Summer Isle, a scientist, agronomist, and a free thinker. He developed strains of fruits and vegetables that he believed would be able to prosper in the Scottish climate. According to Lord Summer Isle, his grandfather believed, quote, the best way of accomplishing this, so it seemed to him, was to rouse the people from their apathy by giving them back their joyous old gods, and as a result of this worship, the barren island would burgeon and bring forth fruit in great abundance." End quote. Ever since then, the islanders have enjoyed successful crops and have celebrated May Day and other pagan rituals in offering and thanks for the success. The Wicker Man makes the islanders' view of Christianity very clear. Firstly, in a scene from the director's cut in a soliloquy delivered by Lee's Lord Summer Isle, where he says things such as, quote, I think I could turn and live with animals. They're so placid and self-contained. They do not lie in the dark and weep for their sins. They do not make me sick, discussing their duty to God. Not one of them kneels to another or his own kind that lived thousands of years ago." End quote. This dialogue is delivered as the scene cuts between Lord Summer Isle observing some snails outside and Howie praying in his room on his knees. The soliloquy couldn't be clearer on the depiction of those of the Christian faith seen through the islanders. Another telling line is found in the scene where Howie finally meets Lord Summer Isle. I'm laughing because Lord Summer Isle is so sassy and I really kind of love it. So anyway, Howie meets Lord Summer Isle and he speaks of his outrage at the practices he has witnessed since arriving on the island. While Lord Summer Isle tries to answer Howie's questions and explain their beliefs, Howie explodes with comments such as, you have fake biology and fake religion. Have these children never heard of Jesus? To which Lord Summer Isle replies, very straightly, himself the son of a virgin, impregnated by a ghost. This is the belief of Christianity, but by wording it in such a way, Summer Isle has managed to describe a foundation of Christianity in a way 
that perhaps makes it sound fantastical, whimsical, and, you know, maybe even almost pagan. In most scenes, the islanders, when discussing their faith, try to enlighten Howie and explain their beliefs. Communication and understanding is the key to avoiding ignorance, fear, and hatred. It's a very healthy and very mature way to respond to attacks on their community and beliefs. However, on the flip side, Howie's language is very important and telling. He uses words such as fake religion, true God. Since his arrival, Howie has never been open to understanding the islanders. The character of Howie is devout and steadfast in his religious beliefs. But this leads him to have somewhat of a superiority complex. His is the one true faith. His is the one true God. And while the islanders live in a different manner to him, this is absolutely repugnant to him. In one of the scenes, Howie is on his way to the local school and he passes a group of young boys practicing their singing and dancing around the maypole. After passing this, he enters a classroom of young girls where their teacher, Miss Rose, is teaching them about May Day. She speaks of the maypole being a phallic symbol, quote, which is venerated in religions such as ours as symbolizing the generative force in nature, end quote. Howie appears genuinely shocked by this and a little disgusted. He tells Miss Rose that he intends to report this lesson to the proper authorities. He says, quote, everywhere I look, there seems to be degradation, brawling in bars, indecency in public places, corruption of the young. And now I see it all stems from here. It stems from the filth taught in this school. I find this dialogue infinitely fascinating. Because while the whole of the Wicker Man is based around the differing types of belief and how his discomfort at the Islander's way of thinking, he fails magnificently to see the hypocrisy in his comment and reproach. After all, is this not what all religions and cultures and communities do in a sense? Don't we all teach children from a young age our own beliefs? Do we not all shape and form young minds with our teachings? They're merely different teachings. Alan Brown, writer of Inside the Wicker Man, The Morbid Ingenuities, said, quote, Christianity and paganism are not polar opposites or mutually contradictory. They merely begin from differing first principles. The film's unifying theme is that all religions are merely social constructs, end quote. Howie displays a high belief in his authority and his faith, so much so that in one scene he creates a makeshift cross to place in a graveyard despite that not being the faith of the islanders who are buried there. This belief in his authority doesn't just stem from religion. The other driving force in Howie's life is the law and his position as a man of the law. When he declares he will report the teacher to authorities, the teacher replies, I didn't know a policeman from the mainland had any authority in such matters. To which Howie replies, Ah, ah, well, we'll see about that. It's a very blinkered and assured view of his power and right to enact it. I mean, he threatens islanders with prison on the mainland on numerous occasions. How his actions highlight how he feels his position in law, along with his religion, outranks anyone on the island. However, he is not alone in believing he has more power than he does. The residents of Summer Isle, let's not forget, practice rituals which are illegal including acts of murder and animal cruelty. Despite them being residents of Scotland and in turn subject to the laws of the country, they believe they have rights and authority above the law. I mean, they must do. Otherwise, why would they practice legal rituals? In this matter, both sides feel that neither has to answer to the other. Ironically, by the end of the movie, we realize that it is Howie's devout Christianity and faith in the law that have ultimately been his own downfall. His fate was sealed as soon as he arrived on the island. It transpires that these qualities in Howie made him the ideal sacrificial lamb, so to speak. A man who came of his own free will. A man who has the power of a king by representing the law. A man who would come as a virgin and a man who has come as a fool. Howie remains devout till the end and prays and explains that he is a Christian who hopes for resurrection. He yells that it is him who will live again and not quote, your damn apples. Blasphemy drop. Lord Summer Isle, 
Sassy Lord Summerisle, again attempting to offer some comfort to Howie, says that at least he will have the ultimate honour of dying a martyr's death. Ouch. And despite Howie, through the entire runtime of the film, avoiding and damning the paganism found on the island, resisting the temptations of Willow, he is, in the end, engulfed and consumed entirely by the pagan religion, in the form of the flames in a pagan ritual. Another theme to be found is that of good versus evil, because let's face it, that's what every horror movie needs. They need a bad guy, a source of evil, and we need a hero who we can follow the story through and root for. But while our hero appears to be Howie, a man of the law searching for a missing child, very noble, is he actually good? As I said, he's there on a very noble cause, however, he's rude, ignorant and self-righteous. On the other side of it, we have the residents of Summer Isle who, at first, appear very liberal, carefree, and with a strong, supportive community spirit. And while they are a hindrance to Howie's investigation, they always take the time to explain their beliefs, despite the fact it is usually after they have been attacked for them. And yet, hidden beneath this is the sinister plan and manipulation of Sergeant Howie, with the intent to murder him. They manipulate him, only ever giving the bits of information they want him to have when they want him to have them. They gradually wear him down to the point where he even breaks and enters. He struggles to focus on his praying and is momentarily tempted by Willow. Lord Summer Isle even says to him, quote, But it is we who have found you and brought you here and control your every thought and action since you arrived. So, do Sergeant Howie and the Summer Isle residents represent good and evil, or just two parties of differing human beliefs? The Wicker Man explores the idea that there is no black or white when it comes to good and evil. There are only grey areas and complexities. The funny thing is that while the Wicker Man portrays Christianity and paganism, and both of them in a somewhat negative light, the film has been praised by some Christians and people of the pagan faith, because despite Howie's flaws, he is a man who shows pure devotion to his faith. Even when tested, even when faced with adversity and ultimately death, his faith never falters. And while the pagans are supposed to be the, and I say this loosely, villains, the depictions of some of the practices and rituals are apparently an accurate portrayal. So that is The Wicker Man. I have to say, I thoroughly enjoyed this film. I can't believe it's taken me so long to actually watch it because this was my first viewing. I found it really funny, bizarre, surreal and sinister. There was only one bit I wasn't a fan of and that is the treatment of the animals at the end of the film who were genuinely in there when they set it on fire. And those squeals you hear are genuine. Those are terrified animals squealing. Not a fan. That's not okay. I did read that apparently no animals were actually killed or physically harmed, but then I also read that Eklund claimed some animals did die. Either way, died or not, those animals still suffered. I mean, I guess things were different in the 70s. I don't know. I also read that one of the animals, a goat I believe, was so scared that it ended up urinating on Edward Woodward. Good for you, goat. I'd love to know your thoughts on The Wicker Man. Is it one you've seen? Do you love it? Or is it not your kind of thing? I also want to say a huge, huge thank you to you guys because I recently hit 17,000 subs. And honestly, I still can't believe it sometimes that people want to sit down and actually listen to what I've got to say. But every view, every like, every comment is so appreciated. I love having you guys to share my love of horror with you're the best. And I want to do something to mark it, but um, I don't know what. I'll have a think. But in the meantime, thank you as always for stopping by. I really do appreciate it. Take care of yourselves and I will talk to you in the next episode. Bye guys. <laughs>